Hey guys, what's up? This is Casey. This is Coach Tom. This is Shot Science Overtime number 152. So we want to thank you guys for being here. We just want to keep or let you know that this is our live show that we try to do every Sunday at 1 p.m. Pacific time. This is not like a regular show that we do or a regular Shot Science video that we have a tutorial and explain everything to you guys. Right. This is going to be about an hour long and we're going to answer as many questions from you guys as we possibly can. Right. So if this isn't for you, that's okay. Go check out our library of stuff. But if it is, we really want to help you guys um, in answering some of your questions. Yep. And while we're waiting for people to get here, we, we're going to have a topic that we talk about that we think is going to help you guys become next level basketball players. <laughs> um, so hopefully it's something that will resonate with you guys. And while we're doing that, you guys send us your questions, anything basketball related. So shooting, passing, dribbling, coaching, dribbling, uh, defense, anything, anything. And we will do our best to answer as many of those as we can. And uh, please tell your friends and family to come check us out and go check out all of our social media stuff and hang out with us on Facebook, mm -hmm. Google Plus, Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram. We are shot science on all those things. Right. So love to have you guys on that. But uh, we're going to jump into our topic today, which is the toughest shot in basketball and how to make it. Right. right so right. the toughest shot in basketball. And, you know, we this is something that gets talked about all the time. And I know I've heard about it my in, entire life. Um, you know, somebody throws it out there. What's the toughest shot in basketball? And we're talking about like real shots. We're not talking about three quarter court hook shots or anything yeah, like that. Yeah. We're talking about shots you take in the game. And it's probably something that you guys don't, you probably aren't expecting it to be this, but mm -hmm. what, what is it? Well, you know, uh, probably if we were to ask this question to a whole group of people, uh, probably most of them would not select the right one. Uh, but the biggest problem that we have in shooting in basketball games has to do with that layup. And you'd think, well, that's the simplest shot in, the bas in basketball is the layup. But, you know, there's several things that make that really difficult. Uh, one of the things that I, I really stress when we're working with students uh, uh, regarding basketball and shooting and whatnot is this is that you never shoot the ball right over the front rim or the near rim. If you come in from well, the side of the hold basket. On. T time out. Hang on. Let's talk about why it's the toughest well, shot. Well, we're going to we're going to get there. All right. All right. So, one of the things that people do is they will tend to lay the ball up right over the front rim. That is not an easy shot. You know, you can make it, but and if you're one of the pros, probably a lot easier for you, but the regular players, that is a tough shot to have the right touch on it. But the upshot of it is this, is that making layups is one of the things that people talk to us about on a regular basis, and here's how it goes. Hey coach, when I get to the basket, I can't get the ball in the hole. I get into the middle of people. I can't make the shot. Okay, and so one of the things that we look at is this, is that first of all, when you are shooting that layup, you want to make sure okay. that... time out. Okay. we, we got to talk about why it's the toughest shot before we well, get into helping well, people okay. out. With it. The, okay, well, here, here, part of here, this goes along with this too. Is well, that, okay, I was just going to say, like the reasons why it, it is okay. a tough shot are these. Number one is that... <laughs> Number one is that you are probably going to be contested. Yes, absolutely. Somebody's yeah. going to be all over you yeah. because that's they're trying to protect the rim. And exactly. if, if you're driving in there aggressively attacking it, they're going to be there to, try to, to yeah. try to stop you. And these yeah. are all variables, that, and that's why that makes it more difficult. Exactly. And then there's also the fact that you know people feel a little bit of pressure when they go in, and they, uh -huh. especially if it's a wide open layup and they don't have anybody there, they're going to be you know really feeling like I better put this in, otherwise you know people are going to laugh at me or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you feel that pressure. If there's somebody guarding you, you're going to feel that pressure and think, right. Wow, if that guy's going to try to block my shot, what am I going to mm -hmm. do? Um, the other thing is, is that typically you are going to be, you're going to have some forward momentum and right. you have to figure out how to, to attenuate that because yeah. you know, you're moving forward in space and trying to get the ball into that stationary target isn't always easy. Well, yeah. And you know, the fact that when a lot of players will get into that traffic and they won't protect the basketball. And so one of the things that we like to teach to be able to get you that ability is uh, uh, this relationship, ball, man, basket, or basket, ball, uh, basket, man, man ball. ball, okay? And with that in mind, what we want to do is we want to use our body 
uh, to be able to shield the ball from a defender as we put it up on the opposite side. Now, one of the things that we like to teach is what we call uh, the nose elbow. And the nose elbow is that off arm and protecting the ball as we go up to shoot it. And uh, uh, if somebody happens to catch one on the nose, oh, well, you didn't intend to hurt them or anything like that, but you want to keep them off of you. And that usually will get you in a situation, too, where they're going to foul you. So that relationship is really important. Yeah. And, you know, people, the reason why people f get real uptight about layups is because there is an expectation that you should make every single one of them exactly. all the time. Exactly. And technically, you should. Yeah. But... Uh, you have to also be aware that there are going to be these variables. If somebody's challenging your shot, yeah. then that's going to be an extra variable, which is going to add to the complexity. Sure. And you know that's that's something you have to kind of attribute for. Sure. And that's fine. But when you are you know worried about all of these things that are going on in your mind, you have to really kind of get to the Zen point where you feel <laughs> like you're you've done it a bunch of times. You yeah. know how, what it's all about, and you also don't make the shot more complicated for yourself. Yes, we see that all the time oh, where, yeah. you know, somebody drives in and maybe they have a defender come over or off onto them and then they try to do some double clutch or some circus shot or, or whatever it is that makes it, your shot that much more difficult. Well, I mean, there's good luck trying to make those little flip shots in traffic with people all over you. That just well, doesn't happen. The thing that the reason they do that, too, is so they don't get blocked. Well, hey, if you take the other approach. I'm going to take it right to them, yep. and uh, uh, we want to get the body into them. We want to get it up there strong, and they're probably going to foul us anyway. Yeah, that's the mentality you have to yeah. have. And and so that foul is going to put you, uh, hopefully you make the basket. If you don't make the basket, you get to go to the free throw line and get two free throws on it. And so that's really important that you don't change it. I, I just kind of uh, get kind of... Uh, 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 upset when I see somebody going for a lay-in and they're leaning way out to the side. And they've got the arm out here trying to flick it in. Oh, it's it's. And a... we refer to that as a hope shot. Oh, and a hope it... shot is we hope it goes in and it almost never does. Yeah, well, it's a bailout for the it defense. A, it is it because is. the defense you just made their job easy. Yes, right. Because if you're taking the ball to them and and they're going to challenge you, make them foul you. Exactly. Don't give them the, the easy out where you try yeah. a, a shot that has a 3% chance of going in. Yeah. That is the worst thing you can do. Yeah. You really just want to go in there and challenge them. And if they foul you, that's awesome. If they block you, hey, at least you gave it a shot. And next right. time down the floor, you can do the, do something different to get a bucket. Exactly. No right. big worry. Or exactly. you might luck out, make the basket because you're focusing on the finish. And they might foul you. You go to the line. They get a foul on them. Mm -hmm. And you just took... You know, you just pretty much hit them with every kind of penalty they can take on that play. Yeah. And, and you know, with what risk that they were going to block you, yeah. I think you can live with that. Sure. And, and so this kind of gets back to that relationship of defender, you, ball. Okay. Yeah. And so when you get the ball and you get it away from the defender and you finish, that's probably when you're going to be strongest on the finish. Yeah, I mean, think about it. If if I want to protect the ball, I'm not going to hold it right here in between my dad and myself Yeah. because you, you got your hand on it. If I want to protect it, I'm going to put it out here because if he reaches across, reach across, even straight across okay. right here, Yeah. I mean, that's across my body. It's either going to look like a foul or it's going to be a foul. Yeah, exactly. So use your body to protect the ball yeah. on, on anything, whether it's ball handling, whether it's going up for a layup, I mean, all of those things are great places to use your body as kind of a, a buffer zone. Yeah. Because if they if they reach across, it, they don't even necessarily have to touch you. It yeah. can it can look like a foul, and you'll get the call. Right. Um, okay. Let's go to another uh, part of this too. One of the things that I see quite often, because I get around to quite a few of uh, uh, the youth basketball, the travel team basketball games, and one of the things I, I witnessed uh, two or three times this day. <coughs> Excuse me. Two or three times uh, last week in a game that I was watching, it happened to be a girls game, but it doesn't make any difference if it's girls or boys. Uh, and they've got players going to the basket and they've got their hand behind the basket or the basketball. And when they get to the basket and they put it up, all of that run up speeds added to the back of the ball. And so it hits the basket and it bounces out to the free throw line. So they don't have a chance really to make it. And so we really encourage people uh, instead of having that kind of delivery on the free throw that we want to go up uh, underhanded as much as possible, and we then uh, uh, take and um, put less 
uh, of that run-up speed on the basketball because when your hand is under versus behind, you're not going to put much as much power on the basketball when you run up. And it's going to make that shot an awful lot softer yeah. as well. I mean, with any shot in basketball, you have to have a certain amount of touch on, on, yeah. the, on your release. Yep. And we've found that it's easier to have that softer touch when you have the underhand yep. release on the lay-in. Absolutely. Um, yep. You know, it, you can do the overhand release. That's fine. But if you're struggling with it, give the underhand att- attempt a, a good go. Yeah. Um, because otherwise, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things that you'll continue to struggle with. You have to learn how to take off that forward momentum from your body's energy from the ball. Yeah. Because if you're adding that onto the ball as it hits the backboard, then it's going to just come right Ooh. off. You have to be very soft with it. Right. And uh, oh. another element that comes yep. into play, did I, am I cutting no, you No, 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 go. Another element that comes into play is that when you're shooting the ball underhand, particularly underhand, uh, is that you uh, do not release the ball at a high point. You tend to release the ball uh, probably just above your face. And any kind of, of layup shot, there should be full extension of the arm so the ball is released at a higher point. Yep. And not only that, uh, it makes it very obvious to officials when there's contact with the arm. You release it down low. Sometimes they don't really see that. But you get it up nice and extended, and you can hear that contact on the arm. Or, uh, and, and so that we, we think that that's important at a high release point on all lay-ins. Yeah, I mean, and using the backboard. I mean, we well, talked about time, this. Hold on, time out. We're, we're on, not going to get wait there yet. Hold wait on. Wait <laughs> well, okay. I, I just want to talk about what you're talking about. Okay. When you get up there and you are using your body and you're extending up high, it's going to be impossible for that guy to get into that body's air, your body's airspace without creating some kind of contact. Exactly right. If you're holding it down low, that's so easy. And you watch, uh, you know, Andre Iguodala. Oh, He's oh. done it about 15 times yes. in the last three or four series in the playoffs yeah. where he has just smacked the ball right out of LeBron's hands, exactly. smacked the ball right out of Kevin Durant's hands. And that's because they have the ball right out here. Yeah. And that's, it's, it's, it's not only is it right in arm's reach, it doesn't look like a foul because his arms are in kind of that plane where they should be. When you yeah. get it up high and you get your body between them, there's going to be body contact and there's probably also going to be contact on your arm. Right. So you have to get that going for yourself as well. Right. Well, and then one final thing that probably is really important when you're shooting a uh, lay-in is if you have somebody with you, which you usually do, uh, either they're, along, they're in front of you, alongside of you, or behind you. If they're behind you and you feel like they may try to block the ball from behind, make the jump stop. Mm-hmm. And when you make the jump stop, immediately go right up to the basket because what's going to happen is they're going to run over you. Yep. Uh, and uh, the, they can't stop quick enough. They don't know what it is you're going to do. And so, and if you started that shooting motion, then they're going to give you uh, uh, two free throws if you don't make it. Okay, and so that's really important. And the other thing is that when they're running alongside of you, what you want to do is you want to take and get a little bump into them. Uh, right here with Casey, if I was shooting with the other hand, I'd want to take and just give just a little bit of this motion to create a little space and create a situation where he's a little more off balance. Yeah, in those situations, you have to not uh, have the urge to just like kind of blast that person. Exactly. Lo- if you lower your shoulder or you use your arm or you push off or your forearm, you will get called for an offensive foul. Yeah. But if you kind of just jump into their space just like that, I mean, yeah. I, I didn't make it look like I was trying to foul them mm-hmm. or anything, but if you just kind of go into it, as you're going up into your shot, then it's gonna it's gonna be you creating the contact. Yeah. The consequences are gonna be for the defender. Right. 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 So that's that's a that's one of those kind of old old school uh, basketball things that that people learn after many years of playing. Yeah. Learn how to draw the foul. So many yeah. people are concerned about it. You know, I don't want them to foul me. I don't want them to touch me. <clears throat> you should have the mindset you're gonna create the situations where the foul is going to happen. The thing that's really important, too, is that, like, if, if I'm going up for a lay-in uh, and, and Casey is right on my shoulder, other hand, uh, then what I want to do is I want to just give him that little nudge, and we call it leverage. We're going to leverage him just a moment, and you can see him kind of move away, and that creates a little space for him to get that free. Yeah, because because so, most of the benefit is given to the ball handler. Yeah, yeah. Because it, you kind of have to respect their like you know airspace as we kind of call it sometimes. Yep, yep. And if you don't, then you can get called for a foul even though the contact is initiated from the offensive player. Exactly. So exactly. you 
you use that as an offensive player. Okay, now let's let's get to the last situation. That is that guy that's right in front of you. He's down the floor and he's getting himself set up to take a charge. Okay, uh, one of the things that we like to teach. In fact, if you go to our our our, our videos on YouTube, you're going to see finishes at the rim where we talk about some of these things. But one of the things that we like to do when we've got that guy right in front of him, we don't want to run over him because that's probably going to, he's going to take the charge and the ball's going to be going the other way. Yep. I take the foul. And so we really like to teach that when you're coming in there and that guy is located right in front of you or he's moving into that situation, you use a jump stop on both mm -hmm. feet. And when you do that, what happens is the game stops momentarily. And that momentarily rest in there gives you a moment to determine what it is that you're going to do. And there's probably three or four or five things that we show in, those, in that video that how to execute the finish so that you don't foul that guy. Yeah, and, and have some options. I mean, yeah. you don't have to know every one of them. But if you know two or three, four of them, yeah. and you have a counter then you're going to be in good shape. Right. And, you know, is it's it's one of those things where you if you have the tools, you're going to be be confident in the execution of those tools. Yeah. But if you only have one tool, you're you're going to be in trouble because you can't use the same tool every single time. Yeah, you know, that's that's a term that we use a lot uh, in our instruction and whatnot is uh, you got a bag full of tools and maybe you've got a really small bag and so you don't have very many tools and you get into the game and you need something that's not there. And so we like to talk about uh, when you are working on uh, these different situations that, oh, there's a tool that I want to have because I want to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's another one over there that I want to have. And so your bag begins to get a little bigger. Now, the one thing that's really important, you can have a bag full of tools to allow you to do a whole lot of different kind of things. But if you never work on them, if you don't spend any time on them, those tools, you can't get them out of the bag. They just won't come out. And so you have to spend time working on execution of those different moves so that when it's time for that tool, it's out and you're ready to go. Okay, so let's kind of sum everything up. Okay. <laughs> Number one thing on the toughest shot in basketball is that you always need to focus on the finish. Focus on the finish you, is the thing to do. Yeah. You can't be concerned with what that other defender is doing. You can't be worried about what your teammates are doing. You... You, even if you are trying to get the contact from the other guy, you need to focus on putting the ball in the right spot. Exactly. And getting it in the finish of, or getting the finish so that you get the benefit of at least taking the shot. You know, everything else is is just bonus for you if it happens. Right. Something we didn't really manage, uh, uh, mention here is, and this is so key, is where do we want to put that ball well, on the backboard? That's, that's what I was going to say. Okay. Is that uh, we also have another video where we talk about how to, I think it's called How to Never Miss Layups or mm -hmm. something like that. And that's got Chase in it. And Chase is explaining the fact that so many people, and this, you said a little bit about this earlier, is that so many people try to go over the front rim or, or just go over the rim to get the layup in the, right. in the basket. Worst decision you can do because you generally will hit the rim which will either have it pop out or it will roll and it'll fly out the other side or whatever. It is a bad, bad thing to do. And we've seen games lost on that. Yeah. Um, Patrick Ewing has a very, uh, very uh, horrible memory of losing, a, a, you know, his chance at going to the finals because of one of those shots. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to never do that. You always can take one extra step or glide a little bit further and put the ball off the backboard. The backboard has a sweet spot on it mm -hmm. where if you hit that spot, you will make every single layup that you do. As long yeah. as as long as you're not chucking it off of it, yeah. you will make it pretty much every time you put it in that spot. And what that, is the sweet spot? That sweet spot is typically right there in the corner of the shot box. Uh, and upper corner, upper near yeah. corner is where you want to put it. So near meeting on your side, upper meaning the top. I have a lot of students who come in and they do layups and they're just barely getting it above the bottom corner. And, and that's actually below rim level. And so the sweet spot is those upper near corners. If, if you come in from the left, same thing. And if you look at that video, how to, uh, how to never miss layups, we show you uh, on, with graphical detail yeah. exactly where to hit it. Right. So that's kind of our little rundown of how to make this toughest shot in basketball. Yeah, yeah. It shouldn't be the toughest shot, but it is because of all these things that can happen and go wrong and uh, that are happening in your head. But if you do these little fixes, you will be in good shape with it. Absolutely. And there's no reason to panic when it comes to layups. Yeah. All right. So we hope that's going to help you guys. If you have more questions about layups, let us know. 
but right now we're going to jump into asking and answer or answering your guys' questions. So hopefully send us any questions you have on anything basketball related, shooting, passing, dribbling, uh, defense, coaching, whatever, vertical jump, athletic conditioning. We will do our best to answer those for you guys before we run out of time. The sooner you get them in, the better, because when we get to the end, it is, it is you know, kind of the lottery if, if you're getting them in. <laughs> yeah, right. um, so send us those questions. Tell your friends and family. Follow us on all our social media stuff. We are shot science on everything. Um, and we're going to have the question of the day here, which is the question of the day every day we have it, because we want to know. Where are you from? We yeah. want to know where your contacting is from. Uh, and it, it, some of those contacts are so much interesting for us, are so interesting for us to see. They come from all over the world, which is super. Yeah, Just, because we're, we're sitting here in, in California in yeah. the United States. Yep. And, uh, you know, we're south of San Francisco, right on the, right on the coast. And we want to know where you guys are. Yeah. Are you in Lithuania? Are you in Senegal? Are you in fill in the blank wherever? We want to know. Because we like to see how far Team Shot Science uh, spreads out around the, the globe. Right. Um, but let us know, and we'll shout a few people out, too. Okay. But let's jump into some questions here. Oh, wait, hold on. Here's one from Momar Indaye. He says, hi, I'm from Senegal. And every time I'm, uh, every time I'm a right-hander, every time I shoot, my left hand interferes. And when I remove my left hand to shoot, it's too weak, and I airball. Okay. If you remove your other hand, let's say we call that the assist hand uh, and not the uh, guide hand. But if you remove that hand from the ball... You not you shouldn't be removing any power at all because that hand shouldn't be offering any ball any power into the shot. Right. One of the things that you can do is go to our videos and and see where we talk about power for shooting and power for shooting actually comes from our middle or core body and our legs. That's where most of the power comes from. And we try to take and keep this in mind that our arms and hands are actually the guidance system and they offer only about 15 or 20 percent of the total power that we need for shooting and your assist hand is a real culprit and and you've realized that because it's screwing your shot up and when it you take that hand off usually what happens is that you're going to have a little bit of inconsistency in your stroke for a little bit but after a few minutes even that that soon you will be able to find when that hand comes off the other hand is going to be able to get the ball to the basket if you got the legs connected to the shot, and that's important. Get the legs into it. Yeah, and I think that it's also important that you take one aspect of our form shooting drill, yep. and if you go look at our video on it, you will see this, is that you start. You should get real close to the basket, start in close, yep. and get the ball only in your shooting hand and work on that one-handed shot delivery many, many, many times until yep. you master it, yep. and then start to add in that other hand and make sure that its influence is very minimal yep. um, or n not or at none, all or none because yes. as you start to elevate it should fall away anyways um, and if, just if you if you watch great shooters like curry thompson um irving uh durant all of those guys as the ball gets very near the top and ready for lease the other hand comes away and it's a one-handed shot and so um, that we just think that's something. You, now, one of the things we ought to tell them, Casey, where are all those videos that they can uh, study up on those? Well, I mean, if you're watching us on YouTube right now, you're in the right place. Yeah. Just go check out our, our video library on YouTube. Right. Typically on all these videos, too, we put a playlist underneath in the description where you can find yep. here's all the shooting. Uh, here's all the shooting videos. Here's all the dribbling videos, what, wherever they may be. You can go look at those playlists there. But go look at that uh, form shooting drill. And you will see that one arm shot that uh, we kind of we, we tell you to start off there very close in because it teaches you to be a one handed shooter. Exactly right. Um, OK, this one is from Eric Pittman Sr. who says, should I shoot with a high arc on the ball or a lower one, a.k.a. Ben Gordon shot or Kobe shot? Well, you know, we're big proponents of having a nice arc on the shot. And the reason that uh, and I'm just going to mention this and you can go find out in our videos why. Uh, what happens when we shoot a flat arc? Actually, our target gets smaller. Uh, or a, a flat arc means a, a smaller target. A high arc means a larger target. And so we always teach everybody to take and shoot with a higher arc. And I'm not going to spend time explaining what, how much that arc is, but you go to those videos and, and you'll be able to see what we're talking about and why that's important. Yeah, just with like with anything, there are extremes. Yeah. You can have too little and too much arc. Exactly right. Too little arc and you're going to have problems getting the ball into the basket because, as you were saying, that, that target shrinks as the ball has eyes when, it, when it's in flight. And it will see less of the rim 
the flatter it is. So you might be only using this spot, this back part of the rim as exactly. usable real estate to go in. But as you increase that arc, it's going to see more of that target, more usable space shows up. And so it's going to be able to uh, have a higher chance of going in. The other extreme is that if you have too much arc, is that you're technically shooting a longer shot. And so there's more things that can go wrong. It's going to be harder to be accurate. So you really want to find that uh, kind of medium arc uh, that isn't too high, isn't too low, but it's going to give you enough to give you as much usable real estate at the target that you need. Right. And, and you know, um, one of the things that I find is that when I have a student or many students for that matter, who uh, go away for a while and they, they call me and say, coach, my shot is awful. And can you help me? Okay, let's bring, come on over and we'll take a look at it. First thing that I know I'm going to see is this, they're shooting the ball flat. Yep. I had a young man yesterday um, and uh, he was, his shot get, never got higher than maybe this high uh, above the rim on the way to it. He couldn't yep. hit it at all. Well, uh, then we have a shooting machine that has netting around it that goes up to about 14 feet. Okay, and so we went down there and I said, this is how high you have to shoot that basketball to be able to be effective. And without that net, you forget about that. And you start, you're just, the thing starts to flatten out more and more and more. And you have to be very uh, aware that the ball needs to have a high arc. And yeah. how, uh, how high? Uh, go to that video and find out. Yeah, and think about this too. If you, if you are the ball, think about the, the flight of the ball uh, from your perspective as the ball. Right. Well, how much of the rim are you seeing as you come in hot on that flat arc or as you have on the nice arc, you can actually see into it. Yeah. Um, you have to use, find that usable space on that different plane of, of, uh, you know, of aim. You're not looking at it straight on. Yeah. You're trying to get it up and over. You need to find that usable space. Yeah. Um, so check out th that video. And you know, I, I think a lot of it too is start out close, Work on having that nice arc in close and progressively work back. Yes. If you're trying to do, go from close to far back immediately, typically you're going to have a real flat shot when you try to do it from, from distance. And little success. The other thing I want to add to that too is okay. that you should be able to diagnose issues with your shot based on how the ball reacts when it gets to the basket. Yes. If the ball is rebounding right off the front rim and, and coming back right to you with that low angle, that means your shot is very flat. Right. If it hits the back rim and it does the same thing, very flat. Um, if, it's, if it's getting to the rim and it hits the rim and it bounces several times right around the rim, then you're probably in good shape. Yes. Because that means that you're getting kind of a, the, the right angle of incidence as it drops down onto the basket where it's finding that usable space and then it's also going to have kind of the ability to stay around the rim yes. and go in for a second chance. Yeah, So very true. If you're watching, and, and conversely, if it's going off to the right or left, there's reasons why it's doing that as well. And if you want to fit, find all those things out, you can go watch our video on how to fix your shot. And we, sh we run you through all of those different scenarios. If it fall goes off the front rim, back rim, side rims, it hits off the backboard, air ball. We, we tell you exactly what, what's going on and how you can diagnose and fix it yourself, which right. is important. Right. All right. Uh, Eric is also, he, he wanted to tell us that he is from Chicago, Illinois. All right. All right. Hello in Chicago. All we right. got a lot of people in Chicago. We do. We do. Um, Devin Blizzard and Christopher Jackson say they're from Connecticut, USA. Awesome. Dominic Souza is from Eugene, Oregon. Ty is from Baltimore, Maryland. Um, Kevin or Kevion Dye is from Memphis, Tennessee. Austin Fritz is from Michigan. Abdu Zak is from Algeria. Awesome. We got a lot of people on here. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. We're, we're going to get some more people here in a little while, but uh, let's see here. Lawrence asks, how do you drive to the basket without getting scared? <laughs> um, the reason that we uh, are afraid uh, anytime we do anything in basketball is because we have a low level of confidence in what we're doing. And I used this term, um, I think, last weekend, too. Um, you know, the great John Wooden, who coached at UCLA, uh, one of the things that he always professed is this, is that fear uh, is the result of a lack of preparation. And that's a comment of his. And yep. so what he's really telling you is that that fear can go away once you feel like you have prepped well enough that you can do this without having that level of fear. And so that's kind of the approach we take with everybody is that uh, you probably in the beginning, you're going to be afraid to shoot a hook shot. 
uh, because you don't know what it's going to do. And then after you practice for a while, you get better and better and better and better. And pretty soon you're waiting uh, to use it on somebody and you use it. Oh, that, oh, 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 okay, that's cool. And then you de begin to develop confidence and getting that done. So it, the, uh, any of the fears you experience in basketball are usually due to a lack of preparation. Okay? And, and you have to put yourself in those scenarios yeah. before you get there when it counts. Yes, that's true. So you have to run yourself, uh, you know, doing these game speed, game intensity practice right. scenarios so that when you get into an actual game, it's not like the first time that you've ever tried to drive to the basket yeah. on somebody. Yeah. Right, so get to work on the three pillars of practice to start off. But also, like you're saying, you need to go work on these these specific skills. So like you're worried about uh, driving to the basket, you probably need to work on your offensive moves. So yep. jab step, long one and one, uh, the diamond, the hammer. And then you need to work on your dribble attacks. Yep. Have a few dribble attacks that you can use. And then finishing. And then it then finishes at the rim. Right. And once you have those things down and you kind of have a repertoire, then you can step out there and, and actually be able to tap into that stuff. Yep. If you only have one thing that you can do, and that's just dribble in a straight line, <laughs> I would be scared too. Yeah, truly. So, <laughs> so yeah, you gotta you gotta really work on on figuring out uh, you know a little bit of a plan of attack on that stuff. Right. Um, okay, this one is from Marie Solil Rio, who says they are from Quebec, Canada. And what's your best tip for making three pointers? Oh wow. Uh, well, you know, one of the things that we always start with is that anytime you're shooting any kind of shot, but particularly uh, long shots like three-pointers, is that you start short and you make sure that you have a very efficient um, uh, shooting mechanics. And, and you find that out by uh, maybe uh, check, it out, check out our videos on what we think is really a good shooting, um, uh, shooting mechanics. When you have those and then there's repetition, 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 and you start at a shorter distance and then you work your way back. Now, you don't do that maybe in all, all in one day, but over the course of maybe a week or so, pretty soon you're shooting from eight, nine feet, you're back to 12, 14 feet, and then you're back behind the three point line. But this is not something that happens just like that. You have to take and build up to it. Your shot has to be effective and efficient. Uh, if it's not, you're probably not going to be very successful, no matter how much you practice it. Yeah, I, I think that that's probably the best advice you can get is to progressively work your way back to the three-point range. Right. Too many people think that there's, you know, something, kick your legs this way or, or put your arm this way. Turn that, your body here. That, that, that is not a good thing to do. Your shot should be the same from three feet as it is at 30 feet. Yeah. And so you have to really work on progressing your way back so that you are innervating all those muscles, you're getting all the mechanics <laughs> down, you're building up the muscle memory for that stuff. And if you're not doing the work to progress back to that point, then it's, it's not going to be a, a good scenario for you when you get back to, to the 25 feet. No, and you know, uh, one of the terms that Casey used there is probably the essence of all of it, and that is developing muscle memory. Once you can develop the muscle memory where you never really have to think very much about the shot, that's when you start to become uh, um, a, a really good shooter. All right, this one's from Constantine S. who says, Hi, this is Catherine. I'm in New York and I get beat very easily on defense. How can I learn to fix that? Well, you know, the typical thing on defense for most people is they don't move their feet very well. Uh, they don't start out with a very uh, good stance in the beginning. Yeah. If you take and go to our videos on, on defensive play, uh, we show you how we think you should take and orient your feet. Years well, ago, let me run this by real quick, Casey. Mm -hmm. Years ago, when I was a young guy, uh, everybody was teaching defense, one-on-one -on -one defense, is that you take the inside foot, the one that's closest to the middle of the floor, and that's the foot that is always forward, and you drop the other one back. Well, uh, and so you can slide that way. But one thing that, that happens in the evolution of uh, this game and all games probably is that coaches realize that if they attack that foot that was the highest there, they could break you down defensively. And that's because you have to open up your body and it takes time to do that. Exactly. And you're, you're going to have to recover and it's going to take longer if that foot yeah. is way ahead. Right. And so the evolution of uh, defensive stance has gone more to squaring up to you, the, the offensive player so that your feet are not staggered like they, they used to teach, but yeah. they are more even, and that allows you to effectively move them sideways and try to, when you do that, 
uh, you can move them from sideline to sideline. And you don't okay. want you don't want to give an advantage and tell them take uh, you know attack this. Yes, you're right. Don't make it easy. Don't make their decision making easy. Yeah. Well, and the other thing that's really important too is that oftentimes when people are moving their feet. Uh, you know, we talk about the defensive shuffle all the time, and that's shuffling your feet so that you can stay with or in front of an offensive player. And so let's say I'm going to go to my right, and so I'm going to reach out hard with my right, and then I'm going to shuffle the other foot in. Step drag. Uh, yeah, we call it step drag. And what happens is that oftentimes when you do that, you step out uh, in, well, let's see, I can't get my hands right here, but what happens is that your feet come together. And when your feet come together or very close together, your body actually uh, uh, begins to stand up. And then you begin slower. Yeah. And so when we go step drag, what we're doing is we're moving that foot out to the side and the other one then pulls up but doesn't get really close to it. We don't want to get taller in our defensive stance. We want to stay lower. And the reason for that is we're able to use our body then more if somebody is trying to get by us. Well, it's, it's the inchworm effect because yeah. if, if you are stepping out wide and then you come back together like this, you have to stand up and yeah. that's going to raise your center of gravity. Exactly. So if your center of gravity is going like this all the time, it's going to slow you down. But if you can kind of keep your center of gravity right here and stay low, you will be in good shape. And yeah. you can also change directions much easier yeah. because changing directions when your center of gravity is high is very difficult to do. Yeah. When we teach step drag, one of the things that we always do is that if I'm going to step with my right foot, I turn my toe in that direction. Yeah. That opens up my hip. And, and I reach in that direction. And then as I get closer to it, I'm going to pivot on that toe. Same thing, I'm going the other way. Always point that finger or that foot in that direction. And you, you step and pull and drag that, that trailing foot. It's not, it's not a lift up, set down, lift up, set down situation. Yeah. It is yeah. a step, pull. Yeah, and when you start lifting that foot up to go, that's time that is elapsing and that's in favor of the offensive player. And having that foot down too, it allows you to be able to change directions yeah. if you need to. Yeah. If you're picking things up, it has to go back down for you to be able to, to you know, change direction on right. it. But if you have it so that you're stepping out and you're dragging it, you can instantaneously change your direction. Right. So and Catherine, the, the, work, work on footwork and your starting position. Now, I know that there's still coaches uh, in lots of areas who teach with that that foot forward. It's it's all a and, big, as with anything in basketball and sports, really. It all comes down to foundation and footwork. Exactly. And so, uh, one of the other things that I would say that it, that has always been a key for me is that you want to try number one. Th there's two things. Number one is <laughs> deny them the basketball. Do not let them get the ball in the first place. It's tough to go on offense when you can't get the ball. Yeah. And so you know, have that denial passing, denial in the passing lane get all over them so that they can't get the ball, that is a good approach. And obviously they're going to occasionally get the ball. Mm -hmm. But if you have the mentality that they won't, then that's a good approach as well. Right. Number two, which is I think the most important, is beat them to the spot. If they are going to attack you on the right, beat them there. And so the that, footwork's what's going to get you there. So that you either make them change direction or they run over you. Yeah. Because if you're making them change what they're doing with your actions, you are in control. But if you are waiting for them and then trying to, you know, kind of catch up and recover, they are in control. So take control, beat them to the spot. Move those feet, Catherine. Yeah. Um, okay. Let's see here. Um, let's talk to Jay Scarborough who says, I can do almost any post move on guys that are four inches taller than me in practice, but freeze up in games. What should I do? Hey, you know, this goes back to the same thing we were just talking about a couple of minutes ago. And that is the fact that we can't really do things that we haven't prepared ourselves to do. And preparing yourself to do those things means that you have to work on them. And you have to work on the footwork, breaking them down so that they're going to be effective. That's number one. And number two, then getting in a situation where you're working and, and executing those at a higher speed, like a game speed. And then the third issue, and this is something that we talk about all the time, this is the three pillars of practice which make you better, and that is get it to the court and execute it on the court. And be very honest with you, you probably fail the first few times. But then all of a sudden, there'll be that aha, oh, yes, okay? And then you, from then on, you're not going to have any problem. But preparation is really what makes the difference, okay? Yeah. You and can't just know about moves. You have to prepare yourself 
to execute those. Moves. And if you watch somebody like, let's just say Steph Curry, yeah. um, and he, he's out there and he hits that game winning shot with LeBron in his face. And, uh, you know, it, it didn't seem like he could ever make that. And the pressure must have been huge. I can guarantee you that Steph has shot that shot thousands and thousands of times times, with people guarding him with uh you know lots of things happening around him he's hit that shot before yeah and you know the the thing is is that in practice he has set those scenarios up he has played against people taking that shot yeah and that's what you need to do you need to create those scenarios before you get out there on the floor and and create them in practice yeah um okay this one is from Devin Blizzard, who asks, how do I find your video on where you talk about the three pillars of practice? Well, we <laughs> haven't done a, a specific like short form shot science video on it. We mostly talk about it during the live shows. Sure. But we will do well, almost run- every live show. We will make a video about it because people ask about it and yeah. we explain it pretty much every every week. But we'll, we'll run through it right now, yeah. real quick. Okay. The first pillar, and these are the three pillars of practice. The first pillar is you want to uh, do, work on dialing in and kind of getting your mechanics into uh, as, as refined and efficient as possible, let's say. Yeah. So that means if you're doing something on shooting, you probably want to do the form shooting drill and you want to break everything down so it's nice and slow. There's no variables going on except you working on your mechanics and you're working on making sure everything is the way that it should be. Uh, you know, if you're struggling with your elbow being out, you're going to work on getting the elbow in and you're going to get the muscle memory and repetitions in on that. If you're worried, if your finish isn't good, you're going to get the finish in the right place and you're going to work on it without any other variables. You're going to work on progressing back and getting your shot so that it has more range, but you're not doing anything too crazy. The second pillar is game speed, game intensity work, where you're going to take the stuff that you learned from the first pillar and apply it to kind of the speed of the game so that you're either adding in a defender or you're pretending that the defender's there, you're coming off of the dribble or you're coming off of the the pass to get your shot and you're just working at it at the intensity that you would if you were in a game. Right. right. And you can do that for ball handling, you can do that for defense, whatever it is, you can you know substitute out whatever specific basketball yeah. thing you're doing. The third pillar is applying the first and the second pillar into actual game experience so that you are out there you're playing games, pickup games, traveling team games, club games, school games, whatever it is, working, using all this stuff in actual competition. Right. And the more you get to do that, the better it will be when you actually get into kind of a more important setting and you'll be able to execute it because you've done it and been there before. Right. And so it's always good to have a balance of all that stuff. Right. Just because you're Steph Curry doesn't mean you ignore the first pillar. Yeah. Or the second pillar. Uh, So you always have to be addressing this stuff through your career. So that's the three pillars of practice are really kind of just a very simple, obvious framework that we think is good for you guys if you want to be better at these given skills. Yeah, and you know, as you're working on uh, game speed, some of the things that we always kind of forget is the fact you've got a defender in in your face when you're working at game speed. The other thing is that you want to make sure that you are working uh, uh, in a situation where you get a little fatigued because when you're playing basketball, uh, there oftentimes you've got to shoot the basketball when you're feeling like you're really gassed and you still have to be effective with it. So you need to get all of that stuff down before you... uh, uh, feel confident with the shot. Okay, we're going to lightning round a little bit of this. All right. Um, it, anyways, let's m- mention that Jay Scarborough is from Mississippi. All right, Chase. And Yusuf Fidan is from Vienna, Austria. Wow, Vienna. Oh, boy. Cool. Oh, and, and Ty is from Baltimore, Maryland. All right. Um, let's see here. This one is from Abduzak, who says, I'm a rookie coach from Algeria. What are the tips to what are tips to manage nervous players in close games? Oh, gosh. Um, you know... That's an interesting question. Um, I, okay, well, I'll, I'll just the, do, one of the things ahead. that one of the things that comes to my mind is players, and you hear this used, this term used quite a bit, are kind of a reflection of their coach. And th- what that means is that if the coach is kind of a uh, out of sorts, uptight, screaming, yelling, um, then his players are going to probably not feel very comfortable. And one of the things that, that I know I've used in the past and probably more in my older uh, coaching years than when I was a young guy is that uh, we'll take a timeout and I talk to them in a very calm voice and, and really, okay, let's get down and 
get ourselves under control here and just play smart. And, and those kind of calming kind of conversations probably are, are much better than, uh, you know, being very hyped up. Okay, we're going to do this and do that. And, and, and well, you're very excited. And so they're very excited. And so they are a reflection of you. And I think by the time you kind of slow it down uh, before, you, before you really say anything in the huddle, take a moment, kind of decide what it is that you're going to touch on, and then be very calm about how you're going about it. I was watching uh, uh, Steve Kerr uh, throughout their playoffs uh, this year and he calls a timeout and the guy is just ice on the sideline he is calm uh, Popovich okay. is the same way and Popovich is the same way and and so his players always play with a pretty even temperament throughout the game even in the tense games okay uh, and so I think probably the temperament of the coach if you can be more settled and you can be more calm then probably your players <clears throat> are going to kind of be there too well, players are going to be looking to you for guidance on how yeah. to how to be, uh, you know, kind of receiving that 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 situation as well. Yeah. So if you are calm, they will be more calm. Yeah. And I think also it's good to impart to them that they can only worry about what they have the power to deal with in the present. Yeah. They can't go back and change anything. They can't go forward and and do anything either. They can only wor worry about what they're doing right in that moment. Well, so work on this possession. We are doing okay. this and. That's that's all you can really worry about. Here's another thought that I think is real important too. Don't don't try to cram too much into a timeout. Yeah. Uh, maybe have two things that you're really focusing on. Defensively, we have to do this, this, and this, and we have to be very effective with that. Number two, we have to make sure on offense that we're we're getting to the basket and things like that. Okay, let's go. And uh, when you try to cram now. I'm not going to take time to tell the story. I'll tell it another time. But uh, I actually took a timeout one time and didn't say anything. And, and, the, and it was really loud. And, and the players are drying themselves off and waving their girlfriends over in the bleachers. And, and so after it was all over, I said, everybody got that? Yeah, coach, we got it. Not a one of them realized I hadn't said a word. I was just moving my mouth. It sounds like you told the story anyway. I did. I tell it all the time. I think it's, I think it's just uh, outrageous. I'm just giving you a hard time because you said you weren't going to say it. I know. I couldn't okay. hold it back. Uh, two things real quick. Number one, this is last call to let us know where you guys are from. So s tell us where, where in the world you guys are from. We are here in, in California, and we want to know where you guys are. And number two is we're going to lightning round this real quick. We had a little bit of late start, so we're just going to go take a couple more. But this one is from... Uh, uh, I'll answer this one real quick. Amin Dawo says, hey, coach, when I'm playing in games, I don't know what moves to do to get past defenders. Again, work on developing that toolbox of moves, yeah. offensive moves, and then also do the three pillars of practice. Yeah. That is super important. And you, you will start to learn what works when, what to use when, and, and you will be in good shape. Okay, this one is from VKJ Productions who says, are one-hand passes less effective than two-hand passes? Our coach gets very angry when we pass with one hand, even if it's a handoff to the next person in line for a drill. Should I still practice it? Uh, you know, that's kind of a coach's uh, uh, kind of point of view. Uh, I'm not crazy about one-handed passes because <clears throat> sometimes I think they're difficult uh, uh, to control where they go. Well, uh, and here's the other thing is that oftentimes we throw uh, – uh, one hand passes they're like baseball passes or baseball throws they're and, they're, they're very yeah they're, they're, they're very they're, obvious yeah they're telegraphed easy for somebody to knock it down and so i can appreciate what he's saying for me uh there's probably a place for a one-handed pass and and oftentimes if we're going to feed the ball to a, a post, post player, player with a little bounce pass we'll step out and that's going to be a one-handed pass uh, because it's, it gets you in a position to deliver the ball easier uh, uh, to him where he can catch it. So yeah, he, there's a place for one-handed passes, but uh, I would take and, and listen to your coach because he has, probably has reasons he wants you to do that. There's a difference from like a push pass as there is from like a baseball or, yeah. or hook, hooking kind of pass, right. like a drop pass or something like that. The, the thing about it is is that if you consider it, if I am, am going to pass the ball with two hands, I can I, number one, I can fake, and it looks like I'm going to pass the ball. Sure. And number two, I can pull the ball back before I decide that I want to let go of it. Yeah. If I'm trying to do a one-handed pass, as soon as it's starting to go, I'm pretty you much can't committed. Stop it. No, you and can't it stop looks it. like a pass. And yeah. so they, they're not going to respect the fact that I could be faking it or anything like that either. So one-handed pass also, they're not always as um, accurate or safe. Uh, because you know, people try to throw them and put a little mustard on it, and then it's 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 hard to control exactly where it goes. So, two-handed passes are best, but there are 
different types of one handed passes that are very yeah. necessary. But if it comes down to you can sometimes you watch Steph Curry, he gets into trouble sometimes. Yeah. He gets turnovers when he tries to do those one handed passes. He does. He does. Um, Heavy Honcho five hundred four says, "What's the best foot placement for shooting?" Uh, well, if you take a look at our videos, you'll find that it's a staggered stance. We feel like squaring up to the basket is not a good way for you to go. I'm not going to take time to explain why that. If you go to our shooting video playlist, you'll be able to see that and where we describe why that we think that this should be done this yeah. way. Yeah. So anyways, let's do a quick little demonstration. Video is the best spot for that. But here's squared up to the basket. We say put your, off, off, your non-shooting side foot kind of in the arch of your other foot. Step it out. And then and you're going to have a slight, a slight stagger turn. towards that shooting side right. because you want everything on that side to be kind of more in line. Right. And so. we want our shooting shoulder forward. Oftentimes when our feet are square, <clears throat> our shoulders are square, our hips are square. And so when we turn, I can't get my hands in the right place, but uh, when we turn our shoulder into it, uh, then we get everything in much better alignment, as Casey's talking about there. Right, okay. Okay, we're going to take a couple quick more, and then we're going to be out of here. Oh, okay. uh, cool. This this one is from Nicholas Cavani, who says, Hey, Coach, I play center, and I'm quite tall, but not bodybuild. It's sometimes hard to get a rebound if the opponent is better placed than me. Yeah, well, I mean, that's you know he's he's got better position than you that's yeah. that's one of those things you have to really work for yeah you do and you know um rebounding is such a physical element of basketball and and you have to learn how to use your body even though you might be uh, uh kind of thin you can still using good footwork and positioning you should be able to uh box them out or block them out um okay this one is from fuddy af who says dribbling up court with left hand without losing it takes practice practice just got to work on it. Pound the ball. Yep. Um, <clears throat> Kentucky basketball is asking, how do you stop a taller and bigger player from scoring? You got to work on stopping the ball. You have to work at beating them to the spot. You have to try to deny them the ball so that they don't even get it. And you have to stop worrying about the fact that they're taller and bigger. Yeah, right, right. Um, you probably possess some physical abilities that are better than his, and you're not even really taking those into consideration. So. Okay, we're going to do one more, and All then we're going to get out of here. Right. Oh, Dominic Anderson from Nakagawa Santa Cruz. is from Santa Cruz. So All are we. Right. All um, right, Dominic. Cool. This, this is the last question. This one is from Miggy Melendez, who says, how do I get my shot over a taller defender when he's a taller guy than me? Okay, that's a great question. I love this one. You don't get the shot. The reason that, that you're, you're calling in is because you're feeling like you're not getting the shot that you want because he's not giving it to you. Well, okay, uh, let's get to a situation where he's not blocking your shot. One of the things that we talk about in, in several of our videos is this, is what is a good shot? And you take an, and ask yourself those questions, and here's kind of the, the questions you want to ask. Number one, is this an open shot? You're telling us right now that it's not an open shot. Okay, then there is no shot to start with, okay? And the second question is, uh, I'm open, and is this a shot I can make? And yep. so the, and you, you, your brain processes all that information almost before you can imagine that you're going to do it, okay? And, and so if you have good positioning, the defensive off, is this a shot I can make? It's gone, okay? And then a third thing you want to talk about or ask about is this, does somebody else have a better look than I do? You know, just because you play on a basketball team doesn't mean that you are uh, endowed a certain number of shots every game. Mm -hmm. You have to create those shots, and you have to create them through movement, uh, uh, dribble, uh, attack, and, all, and faking, all that kind of stuff. So you don't have a shot just because you think you ought to get one. And so if he's taller than you, you probably got something that he doesn't have. And that is you're probably quicker than he is. And so uh, if you're going to crowd me, here I go. I'm going to the basket right now. All right, before we get out of here, I'm going to shout out a couple more people. Uh, Papa Thierry uh, says, hi, from Barcelona, Catalonia. All right. Uh, Nicholas Cavani says, hi, I'm from uh, La Baule, France. All right, cool. Mason Riley is from Mississippi. Kevin Say says, hi, from Cali. Miggy Melendez says, they're from New Jersey. Awesome. 
All right. Well, thanks you guys so much for being here. So cool. Yeah, we'd love to hear where you guys are from. Um, but thank you so much for all your questions. If we didn't get to your question, it's not because we don't like you. It's because we ran out of time. <laughs> Um, we try to be here as often as we can Sundays at 1 p.m. Pacific time. So make sure you guys tune in next time for that. Make sure you're following us on all of our social media stuff and come chat with us and hang out. We are on Facebook, Google Plus, Twitter, uh, Instagram, Snapchat, and we are Shot Science on all of those things. So make sure you're there checking out what we're doing. Um, and we got lots of cool stuff coming up. All right. Um, and we will check you guys out next time. All right. Thanks, guys. Yeah. See you later. <laughs>